today on the CTV News at 5, address reaction. The problem is not the price differential. The problem is a lot of government waste. We've seen many examples of that. And really, lack of leadership in addressing the real tough issues that leaders have to do. Fallout from the Premier's address to Albertans. Plus, a by-election will be held in the Blood Reserve after a coin toss decision is appealed. And how Lethbridge's unhealable wound clinic has saved a 96-year-old woman's legs. CTV News with Jackie Scandlebury. Good afternoon. There are plenty of opinions and a lot of questions over Premier Alison Redford's public address last night. She warned that the government is $6 billion short of its projected revenue. Redford blamed the oil price differential, saying Alberta gets 30% of its revenue from oil and gas. She cautioned cuts are coming to some services and programs, but promised to move ahead with infrastructure spending. But Wildrose leader Danielle Smith says she's concerned with the Premier's math that it doesn't work with her promises. The Premier also promised to start investing in the Heritage Fund and to hold a summit next month to look for solutions. It's not good enough to simply take an axe to government spending across the board. That would mean that vulnerable Albertans get hit the hardest. And it's not good enough to take the easy way out and raise taxes. She's promising to hold the line on spending, to not raise taxes, and she was absolutely silent on the issue of debt. Now, despite Redford's promise to not touch the budget allocation for education, school officials locally are bracing for the worst. As we mentioned, over $6 billion of the provincial budget goes towards education and $90 million of that goes to the school district in Lethbridge. The school board says they initially were told to expect more long-term funding, specifically a 1% increase this year and then a 2% increase over the next two years. But over the past month, there have been hints by the education minister to expect much less. Not good news considering school enrollment is on the rise. There are currently around 9,000 students in School District 51 and officials say they'll do all they can to not disrupt teaching positions. Well, we would hope not to impact classrooms. I mean, that's what this is all about. However, about 75% of our budget is staffing and about just under 60% would be teachers. So when you have the biggest chunk of your budget in, in school personnel, uh, it's pretty hard to avoid. Political pundits and opposition leaders are also chiming in. Liberal leader Ross Sherman says the problem isn't revenue, it's spending. Not the price differential. The problem is a lot of government waste. We've seen many examples of that. And really, lack of leadership in addressing the real tough issues that leaders have to do. Sherman says the government needs to stop tying school and health funding to the price of oil and suggested it might be time to discuss tax policy. NDP leader Brian Mason sees cuts to services in Alberta's future and says there is no way for Redford to fix the books without breaking election promises. Now we're going to see um, extensive cuts. I think she signaled that very clearly. While she says that she's going to protect essential services that people need, we can see that they're already under attack. The province had projected revenues of over $13 billion for 2013. The budget will be handed down on March the 11th. Coming up in our 5.30 news, we will hear from Premier Alison Redford as well as Wild Rose leader Danielle Smith. Liberal leadership candidate Martha Hall Finley says that despite the Premier's bleak sounding financial outlook, Alberta will continue to be a strong driver in our country's economy. Finley spoke to Liberal Party supporters today at Giorgio's restaurant. She was in town seeking votes from Liberals in her race for the party's top job. Finley admits that she's in tight against other candidates, namely Justin Trudeau, but says she's in the race to win it. She says she stands behind Alberta's oil and gas industry Paul Finley believes the province will continue to be a strong revenue generator, especially if production in the oil sands continues to grow. But the Premier did talk last night about some things that we've been talking about, about getting access to, for uh, uh, the oil to other world markets. I mean, we know we're a price taker, we know we suffer. And I say we because, again, it is the whole country that benefits from the prosperity. We could be getting world market prices that would enhance Alberta's prosperity, but it would enhance the, uh, the country's prosperity. Justin Trudeau will be in Lethbridge on Monday to speak to the party faithful.
got our first look at weather here. And Dory, a chance that we could see some snow, freezing rain tonight, and maybe again tomorrow. Yeah, and you know, everything is just changing even as we speak, Jackie. It looks like we have that chance of seeing that uh, shower, freezing rain, maybe some light snow tonight. Areas to the west are going to see it tonight and tomorrow. But here in the south, it looks like we might be seeing a little bit of a mini clearing trend tomorrow. So that chance of precipitation has really reduced just in the last couple of hours. But I'll give you the details I have in just a couple of minutes. Okay, thanks, Dory. An election appeals committee is recommending a runoff by election to decide who will hold the 12th position on Blood Tribe Council on the Blood Reserve. Two candidates tied for that spot during an election last November. Robin Little Bear was eventually chosen by a coin toss, but the loser appealed and the appeals committee has decided the fairest ways to proceed by holding a two candidate by election. Terry Vote reports. They put runoff by election. Kyla Crow is getting ready to start campaigning again, two months after losing a spot on Blood Tribe Council through an unlucky coin toss. Her opponent, Robin Little Bear, is a relative, and the women are prepared to fight it out at the polls. Yes. Yeah, we're fine. <laughs> no, we're fine with it. What Crow and many others weren't fine with was the procedure used to break the tie vote on election day. The appeals committee says a recount should have been the first step and should have been done immediately. Instead, trying to do a recount weeks later turned into a nightmare, despite the fact that they were using electronic voting machines. Some people like to believe that machines and are infallible, <laughs> but they're not. It's us who run them. We're all fallible. And, and it depends if you, you know, you have to use best practices. And if you don't, you run into difficulties. Election officials ran into a series of difficulties, from a shortage of memory packs to checking the sensors and running the proper test before the ballots were recounted. Not to mention the ballots themselves were stored improperly, which caused the ink to bleed through on some of the ballots. They were secured away, you know, so there wasn't a question of, of uh, the uh, ballots being tampered with or uh, we losing any, but it was the way they were kept which affected uh, their condition. In the end, it was determined it would be impossible to get a valid or legal recount, either by machine or manually. Well, I understand where the appeal committee is coming from. Um, I just had a few questions myself that I um, responded to the decision that was made. Um, I guess, how, why did it take so long when the recount should have happened right after the election? Band residents say a runoff now seems fair, but some still question why a coin toss was used in the first place. I think they should have uh, done it proper, that way they won't have to be doing this over again. It'll now be up to chief and council to appoint a returning officer and set a date for the runoff by election. Members of the appeals committee say they're hoping that can be done as quickly as possible. Terry Vote, CTV News, on the Blood Reserve. Band Council is expected to set the by-election date on Monday after receiving a written report from the Election Appeals Committee. And local supporters of the Idle No More movement say they need to continue to be vocal and visible if they hope to be successful in getting controversial changes to the Indian Act overturned. With respect, with dignity, with some honesty and integrity for the truth of what happened in this land over hundreds of years, over thousands of years. Thank you very much. Professor Tony Hall spoke very passionately on the topic last night at an information session at the University of Lethbridge. A panel of concerned citizens outlined their reasons as to why the bill is unfair and needs to be revisited in the House of Commons. They're encouraging people from all walks of life to join in their movement so that the voices of all Canadians will be heard by the Harper government. Uh, encounters and relationships speak of issues that go to the very depth of what Canada should be and must be about if we are to rise to a higher standard, if we are to be a beacon in the world that can look out at the world and champion human rights. The diversity of support and the diversity of people that are coming out really reflects that this isn't, this is not an Indian thing and it never has been. It's been a Canadian issue. A second National Day of Action is planned for January the 28th. Well, Canadians know you can stuff a lot into a hockey bag. 
apparently, including over half a million dollars of pot. Redcliffe RCMP uncovered 80 pounds of marijuana packed into plastic bags and then into four large hockey bags and a suitcase during a traffic stop near Irvine earlier this month. 29-year-old man and a 61-year-old woman from Campbell River, B.C. are facing charges for drug trafficking, speeding and having an expired license plate. A Lethbridge Elementary School is reducing their environmental footprint. One, two, three, go! This is Lethbridge's first environmentally friendly water station. Students are being encouraged to fill reusable water bottles, and the water station keeps track of how many plastic bottles are being diverted from landfills every day. The idea came from Emmanuel Napik as part of a school research project. I noticed a problem in our school. It's our water fountains. They're very old, very cumbersome, very difficult to fill up a water bottle. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to try and see what I can do to solve this problem. This is such a neat opportunity for kids to engage in their community and to figure out what their impact is like on the earth and uh, how can they be better earth keepers. Other schools are also looking at adding water stations. Coming up, we've got a look at the markets. Then Dory's back with a forecast right after the break.